You're very welcome to episode 42 of the Scaling Your Business podcast. For this episode, we're going all the way to West Coast, and we've got Colin Mitchell. Colin, you're very welcome to the show. Ah, oh, thanks so much for having me. Glad to be here and excited to jump in. Yeah, excited to have you. Now, the typical format is with guests, we usually go back to kind of chapter one, early days, influences, all that stuff, and then take it from there. So you grew up uh, West Coast, LA, California. I believe you went to high school in, I might butcher this, but 2K? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I uh, I was born in California in the Bay Area and moved around quite a bit as a kid, but always in California um, and, and went, lived in a small town near Sacramento during my high school days, uh, caused a lot of havoc. And I always tell people if, if my kids give me half the trouble that I gave my mom, then I'm probably, um, in for <laughs> a rough time. And, uh, so then moved back to Southern California after that and been here ever since. What are some of your favorite standout memories of your early childhood days? Ooh, that's a tough question, man. I, I didn't have the best childhood growing up. I mean, my dad was never around. He was in and out of prison. Um, was never, I didn't really have a, you know, positive male role model in my life. And my, I was raised by a single mom with three half brothers. And, you know, she had to work nights to keep food on the table and pay the bills, which were a struggle most of the time, which gave me a lot of freedom to do whatever I wanted and kind of figure things out on my own. Um, and, uh, sometimes that was good. Sometimes that wasn't so good. Most times not so good as a kid. Um, but you know, looking back, like I wouldn't change any of it because it's molded me into the person that I am today that has led me to where I'm at now. Interesting because usually you, you, have spoken about your pod, uh, your upbringing on other podcasts and you've mentioned here, single mother, three step brothers. for most people that leads to one of two paths, either, uh, I'll just say it straight out jail, or you've got a massive drive to succeed. What was it that gave you that drive uh, to succeed? Was there anyone that inspired you? Yeah, so uh, I got into a lot of trouble as a kid. Um, we never had money. We had a hard time paying the rent. We sometimes got kicked out of the places we lived at because we couldn't make the rent. And um, life was a struggle. And I got into a lot of trouble and started to go down a similar path of my dad who was, you know, in and out of prison and, and things like that. And, you know, at 20 years old, realized like, I, I don't know what I want to do with my life. Um, but I know I don't want to be poor and I know I don't want to go down the same path he did. Um, and I had a step stepdad who I have a, you know, he's no longer with my mom, but I have a great relationship with him. He's very involved with my kids and comes to their baseball games. And, um, you know, he also had some of his own struggles early on, but it turned his life around and, and was kind of a, a great example for me um, to see that like, hey, there's a better way to live and you can be successful and happy. And, uh, and, and basically, I pretty much begged him to get me my first sales job and he wouldn't, he didn't trust me right away. You know, I kind of had to prove to him that I was serious. And if he was going to put his neck out there for me that, you know, I wasn't going to make him look bad. And, you know, after bothering him for long enough and, and me, you know, having a job, which, you know, at 20, 21 years old, my first job was lugging around furniture. Um, and, you know, I didn't mind it. It kept me in shape. I got to stay outdoors and, you know, it was okay, but it wasn't a career and, and it wasn't what I wanted to do for very long. Um, he finally took a chance on me and, and, and got me a, an interview, got my first sales job. And at that point, I really felt like I had something to prove. You know, I, I, I wanted to prove that like I could have a better life that, you know, I wasn't going to pour, you know, be poor anymore. And, you know, I made the best of that opportunity. And, you know, there was not a lot of good training there. There was a basic script that was, I wouldn't even say average, um, but I learned some good work ethic. I learned some, you know, how to handle uh, uh, rejection. Uh, I learned how to just, you know, pound the phones. You know, I learned some really simple sales skills that, that took me so far. Um, and I worked my way up to the, the top there and, uh, and then was promised a managerial position didn't happen. So I left, 
Um, and that's kind of where it all started. Coming back to the furniture gig that you had for a while in your early twenties, yeah. was it that and your attitude and behavior throughout the period of that, that, that had him go, he's got something here. I'm willing to take a chance on him and get him to his next job. Yeah. I mean, like I was, you know, consistent and, and showing up and, and being responsible and, and had a job and, you know, was doing all of the right things at that age. Um, and, and so, you know, it took a, a while of asking him many times. And I think him just sort of observing me to say, okay, you know, I think you're ready for this, this opportunity. Um, and, uh, and he felt that I, you know, one wasn't going to, you know, make him look bad. And, and two, that, you know, I would actually, you know, do something with that opportunity, which, which I did. Amazing. And you've, you've come a long way since then. Um, you've, you've touched on that your mother is not with your stepfather, who you've got a good relationship with anymore. And you had three step siblings. Um, what's your relationship like with your other siblings, your uh, mother and your father today? Yeah, sure. Um, great question. So um, I have a great relationship with my mother. Uh, wasn't always that way. Um, you know, I caused her a lot of, uh, you know, sleepless nights, to say the least, uh, as a young kid. And, and, you know, she lives about six hours away from from us here in Los Angeles. Um, so we don't see her as often as we'd like to. Um, uh, and especially with, you know, pandemic and all that, it's been even more challenging. Uh, but I have a great relationship. She's very involved with my kids and we video with her all the time. And she comes to visit for birthdays and holidays and all of that. And we go up there when we can. Um, you know, my mom did the best she could with the tools that she had and the resources available, which wasn't much, you know. Um, and, you know, I could have really went other either way as a kid. And, and, um, and so my three brothers, you know, we're not as close as I would like to be just because of there's just such a huge age gap, you know, um, there's like my, my, my middle brother, um, you know, there's 10 years difference, 10, 11 years difference there. So it's quite a big age gap. You know, I was a single kid, uh, only child with a single mom for a long time. Um, and then, you know, had, you know, three half brothers kind of, you know, one after another, the other two are twins. Um, but we see each other. They live here in Los Angeles. We see each other, you know, holidays, things like that. They come over, play with the kids. Um, my, my, you know, he was my stepdad. I, I still kind of consider him my dad, you know, because he's the only thing that somewhat resembles, you know, positive male, uh, male role model in my life. Um, and really sort of helped me get on the right path and, and, uh, has supported me a lot. Um, very, uh, you know, talk to him several times a week. He comes over, plays with the kids, comes to the kids' baseball games, you know, very good relationship with him. You've said baseball twice. Would that be your go-to favorite sport to watch? Uh, it, uh, well, I played baseball as a kid. Um, and, and I was, you know, it's decent. At, I was very, very good at it actually. And, uh, and then just, you know, around high school kind of just, you know, sports became less of a priority for, for me. Um, and my stepdad is a, a big sports fanatic. Um, and my son is just really, um, loves baseball and, um, uh, I get the pleasure of coaching their team and it's been it's baseball season right now here. So it's, it's a lot of fun and it's kind of top of mind for me right now. Slick, through my research of you, here's what I found out. You're into running. Um, you've attended hockey games, swimming, something you like to do early morning, meditation. Um, you're a father and a husband. But what's one thing that you're into or curious about that not a lot of people might not know about you? A pretty open book. I mean, you 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 named everything there with your 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 you know, probably minimal social media stalking or, <laughs> or maybe somebody on your team did some, some, some quick high level research. It, it wouldn't take much effort to find out uh, what I'm all about and what I enjoy. Um, and, and that's just kind of who I am. Yeah. I, I love swimming. I, I swam 2,500 yards this morning. Uh, meditation is a daily practice for me. Um, and is essential for me to, you know, showing up and being the best dad, husband, employer, you know, uh, business person, you know, whatever the case is, it's, it's a huge part of my life. Um, don't run as much as I used to. It's still occasional. Um, but my wife and I actually met in a running group and used to run marathons together and half marathons and trail running and 
Um, that was all pre kids got three now. So that doesn't happen as often as we'd like to, but now swimming is sort of our jam, uh, because it fits better into our schedule. Slick are, are, are your kids, all boys. I know you mentioned one of your kids plays baseball. Yeah, no, I have, uh, one, uh, boy and two girls. So my son Jackson is, um, six years old. And then Olivia, uh, just turned five and I have a two and a half year old and my wife would have a fourth one if I would permit, but I have to know my limits. <laughs> um, we originally connected through podcasts. You host your own podcast. I'll leave a link to yeah. that below. So it's obvious that you're big on the podcast. Why should someone consider starting yeah. a podcast if they're on the fence? Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely love that question. And uh, I actually posted something on, on, on LinkedIn yesterday of like three reasons, three paths to, um, generating, you know, monetizing or generating revenue from a podcast, even if you have zero downloads. So I'll break that down really quick. And then I'll tell you one other reason that I just absolutely love podcasting. Um, so if you're thinking about starting a podcast, you're not sure, uh, whatever you have, maybe holding you back, it is the best way to build relationships with people. Um, and, Typically in business, that's what you're looking to do is build relationships with people. So if you have a show and you're strategic about the types of people that you have on your show and you do it right and you lead with value and you nurture those relationships, at some point, it's going to make sense to either do business together or they're going to feel comfortable referring you business. That's one way. So you can interview the types of people you want to do business with. You can interview the types of people you want to partner with. Whoever is an ideal referral partner or channel partner, or hopefully you have some sort of formal partner program in place. And then the third is a little bit more requires you to play the long game uh, where you interview the types of people that your ideal clients follow. And that strategy takes time. Again, you're going to play the long game there. You're going to want to make sure that your quality, the quality of your content is absolutely amazing. Uh, because with that strategy, you're sort of, uh, the idea is, is that their followers uh, become yours. Uh, so those are three paths to like, how do I generate revenue from a podcast without sponsorships and all the other stuff that, you know, takes a lot of work and time and most people don't have patience for. But the other reason that I absolutely love podcasting is because it's one single activity that accomplishes so many things. So we're doing a podcast right now. So now there's social media content that's created from this. You're building an audience and a following and thought leadership and personal branding. You're investing in that and getting compound interest um, from, from that element. Uh, you're developing and building relationships with the people that you have on your show. Um, and then there's so many other ways that you can repurpose content. You can create a book from your episodes. You can create blog posts. You can create additional social assets. Like there's so many things. You have a video for YouTube. You have short clips for social media. One single activity can accomplish so many things. Uh, but out of all of that, you know, they're all important, but I still believe that the most important thing is the relationships that you develop with the people you've had on your show. Uh, I personally have interviewed over 250 people. Most of those people I have phenomenal relationships with. We do business together. They send me business. I send them business. Uh, it's just a win-win for everybody on many fronts. Couldn't agree more. Since we last spoke, I've actually gone full-time at podcasts and now I put out a new podcast every single day as of a month ago and going forward, that's my full-time focus. Um, but you were previously in the corporate world. What led you to leaving that to starting your own business? Yeah. So um, I worked for some you know smaller companies. Um, and so I left that first sales job, thought like, hey, I, I'm, I'm awesome at sales. Like I should be a sales manager and they didn't give me what I wanted. So I left and, you know, honestly, they were probably right because I was totally not ready to be a sales manager. I was, you know, kind of one of those sales managers that everybody should sell like me. Like, why can't, you know, this is what I do. You know, why can't they do that? And that was sort of, and, and I learned quickly that that was not the proper way to manage people. Um, but I took a VP of sales position at another, co you know, co competitor, basically, um, you know, basically went there and, and drove a bunch of revenue for them, recruited people, trained them. Um, and then it, my wife um, had been in recruitment and she was really unhappy with her job. Uh, we were just dating at the time. 
And uh, I said, hey, I think you should come over here, sort of learn what we do. And then I think we could do this on our own. And so she came over for about a year. And, and then, you know, we, we, we parted ways from that company on good terms. Um, and we started our first company together. Geez, now, uh, I think it would be about 11 years ago. Um, and we scaled that business, you know, all fueled by outbound sales team that, you know, we recruited and trained uh, to 5 million bucks in 26 months. And so that was our first business. I've come across people who've gone into business or partnerships with their significant other. Um, the topic has very rarely come up or lasted long as a conversation. It's probably a better way of saying it. With my girlfriend of working together, I think we would break up if we work together. How do you manage to separate the relationship with work and your relationship with your wife? Yeah. So we started, we started that business together. Um, and, and then we worked together for about three years before we had our first kid. Um, and it was good, you know, I mean, it was fun. Like our first office was in our one bedroom apartment in our living room, you know, and it was a lot of, uh, hustle and grinding and long hours. And, and just, you know, we had big goals, you know, we wanted to start a family. We wanted to, um, buy a house. We wanted to do all of these things. Um, so it was easy to just kind of like stay focused and grind it out and keep our expenses low and, and accomplish those things together, which I think made us even closer in a lot of ways. And she had her role and I had mine and we respected each other for that. And it, it worked really well for us. Like, that might not be the case for some people, but it did. And that has even kind of set the foundation for sort of our relationship today, right? Because she manages the household and, and, and I work, go to work every day and I, she works a whole hell of a lot harder than me. That's for sure. Uh, leave me alone with the kids for, for two hours and I'm ready to rip my hair out, um, which, you know, just happened on, on Mother's Day. We, you know, she went out with her mom and the kids and I, you know, made breakfast and ran errands and did things like that. And it had me, you know, just once again, reminded me of how much I really respect what she does every day. Mm. Um, so that's, that's the recipe right there, gentlemen, uh, you know, do what your wife does for a couple hours and you'll appreciate her that much more. <laughs> um, for sure. And so, yeah, it worked for us. And then, you know, now she's, you know, full-time, you know, managing the house and the kids and, uh, and I have a ton of respect for what she does and she knows firsthand what I do. So she has a ton of respect for what I do and it works really well for us. That's awesome. That's awesome. And um, something you've spoken about in other podcasts is the, the confidence um, and how you lacked it in, I believe it was high school. I know high school is called something different in Ireland. Um, so yeah. I've maybe mistaken by that. It may be, have been earlier, but looking back, have you got any tips for someone who is in you know, their early teens to early twenties, who has low confidence, low confidence at the moment. Mm. Yeah. You know, I had a, uh, I dropped out of high school and didn't go to college, which I think you call university. University, Right. Yep. So, um, and I had a lot of shame around that for a while. Um, and you know, I didn't like talking about it, especially for like out with friends and stuff like that. Um, but, um, I've had, you know, some success at this point. So like now it's, it's part of my story and like, it's really easy to say like, that's who I am. And like, you know, it's taken me on the path that I did. And, you know, I had some shame around like failures and, 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 and things and not finishing things and things like that. But those are all like all of those failures or, or, you know, not, you know, going through that, that, that was my experience. And, you know, all of those experiences have, have molded me into the person that I am today to, to do what I do. Um, and, and I'm very happy with, um, where I'm at and where it's taken me. So, you know, and, and it's tough for maybe somebody who hasn't had any success and they're still maybe like in that sort of like, you know, having a tough time. Um, mm -hmm. but just whatever it is, commit to something. Like I committed that, like I was, when I got that sales job for the first time, and look, it's not, there, there's always sales jobs. Like, I don't care. I mean, most people that got in sales never planned on getting in sales. Like, you know, it was like, Hey, I went to this and hated it and then got a sales job or, Hey, it was the economy was in a tough place. And the only thing I can get was a sales job. And there's some of the best salespeople, mm -hmm. right? For me, it was like, Hey, nobody was even willing to take a chance on me. 
other than this company in my first sales jobs. And so I made the most of it. You know, I was the first one in the office every day. I was the last one to leave every day. And I came in on Saturday to get my list ready for the next week. And I was obsessed with getting better. And there was not a lot of support inside the organization. There was not a lot of formal training. So I seeked outside. I read blogs. I read books. I read, I listened to podcasts. I, you know, bought courses that I could afford. Um, so, you know, take ownership for your personal and professional development. If you're not getting the support and get serious about committing to something and see what happens. I love that. What is your favorite, um, what's your favorite part of being an entrepreneur? Yeah. I mean, I love, I love the early stage startup hustle, grind, figuring things out, making something, you know, turning nothing into something like, I love that part. Right. So I've founded four companies, three have been successful. Um, and I just love the very beginning of like figuring things out as we go, um, and just turning, you know, nothing into something like that fires me up. Yeah. Solid. Yeah. That's a good answer. Cause, um, I'm sure many can resonate with that. Challenges are something you come up against in those early stages a lot. Um, and I'm sure you've, uh, can recount on many, many challenges, or objections you've come up against focusing, let's say on the last specifically 18 to 24 months, what are some of the challenges or objections that you came up against that you didn't expect or account for? And how did you tackle it? Yeah. I mean, people, um, people are not buying, making buying decisions like as quick as I'd like them to, you know, people are thinking about things a lot, you know, longer than normal, you know, buying cycles are a bit longer and patience is not, uh, one of my, um, qualities. <laughs> so it's forced me to actually work on that a little bit, um, which has been kind of nice. Um, and so, I mean, challenge, the, the challenge is if you're not confident in what you do, then it's going to be very difficult, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you get confident? Well, you work on yourself. Like a lot of people think, you know, uh, I got to get better at this, or I got to do more of this. And really it's, it's a lot to do with your mindset. You know, if you invest in yourself personally, you will be blown away on how much more successful you become professionally. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm not, when, 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 when you come from where I came from, there's not a lot that scares you in business. I'm totally willing to take a lot of chances that most people aren't. I'm totally flexible and adaptable because I had to be as a kid, just based on how I grew up. And so a lot of people can get blocked by fear or, you know, not wanting to fail. And it's like, if I ever have those sort of things that come up in a, in a challenging moment or a challenging decision, it's really simple for me. It's like, Hey, what's the worst that could possibly happen? Okay. Can I live with that? And can I navigate through it? And 99.999% of the time, the answer is yes. So if, if I lost everything today, I wouldn't be scared because I'm confident enough in my ability to build relationships and sell anything that I you know, believe in. That's a good way of looking at life and a good way of looking at things. Um, cause something came up earlier on and, and it's, it's had me thinking since you've said it around getting started with podcasts, uh, a lot of people that I speak to and over a drink, the topic of podcasts may or may not come up if it does quite often, it's a measurement they, they, they measure ROI, their ROI is measured in downloads and yeah. awareness of the podcast. But what I've picked up from you is you should be measuring the relationships you're building over the downloads, particularly in the initial stage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I even go against what most any podcast agency or marketing company that's halfway attempting to get into podcasting would tell people is don't worry about the downloads. We don't care about them. Focus on the people. Mm. And that's way more, the downloads will come. And, you know, if you're creating, you know, if you're being real, you're being authentic, you're creating impactful content. Um, you're genuinely curious about the people that you bring on. You're asking good questions. You're actually really actively listening to what they're saying 
to have a great conversation, people remember how you make them feel. Um, and if they have a good experience, then the relationship with those people, like, it's so interesting. I like to tell people like when you have somebody on your podcast, they skip the sales and marketing funnel and they go straight to your relationship funnel. (laughs) And how valuable is that? Something else you've also touched on in this podcast is around investing in yourself, particularly in the early days when you didn't have much, you, you touch on any, any course you could afford that, that would get you to that next step on the ladder. Now, in your current position, is there, do you have any mentors, books you read, podcasts you listen to, to continue to advance you to each of that next stage in the ladder? Yeah, I'm a big audiobook guy uh, and, and, and I love podcasts. Um, I, I listen to podcasts at one and a half speed, consume them up really quickly. Um, um, you know, I'm always on the hunt. I typically have two or three audio books that I'm reading at a time. Um, and, uh, you know, I, one big thing that I would say is, is really important for people in business, entrepreneurs, people in sales, whatever is like, never stop learning, never stop learning, never think that you're good enough or that you've reached your peak. Like I will sit in a prospecting training with my team. I don't care because I can learn something. I will still cold call for three to five hours a week because I will learn something and I'm kind of weird. I enjoy it. You're right. And it's, it surprised me how many times I've been to courses a third, fourth, fifth time. And either you, you look at it differently, it clicks with you differently, or you pick up a golden nugget that you didn't pick up from the previous time. So I'm, I'm, I'm bored with you there couple of questions that uh, I've, I've asked other guests as well. One of them being travel being restricted in the last 18 to 24 months. If you could travel anywhere in the world right now and you could bring your family with or you could leave them behind, where would you go to? My wife would probably have a better answer for that question. Um, anywhere but, in the world that you'd like to see? Interesting enough, I would probably go to Ireland and I'll tell you why. Uh, that's where my mother-in-law is from and my wife has been there and they have family there. Um, and, uh, and I'd love to bring the kids there. Well, you've got a friend in Dublin if you ever do make it over. Yeah. What continues to drive you, Colin? My family, man. I mean, my family is, is, is number one for me. Um, they're, you know, what drives me every day to get up and do what I do. Um, and you know, I, I don't work crazy hours, man. I, 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 I have a crazy routine that starts the night before and into the morning uh, to invest in myself personally so that I can show up professionally for eight hours a day and just absolutely, totally crush it and then go home and be home with, uh, be home with my kids and my wife. Nice. Two final questions. Question number one is uh, your kids, your wife, any animals or pets you have are also safe, but your house is burning down and you can only say one item. What item is that? Oof, uh, one item. I'm not a big, um, I'm pretty, I'm a pretty minimalist guy. So running out of the house, house is burning, kids and dog are safe. What would I grab my swimming gear <laughs> interesting it's a different answer than usual usually it's a laptop or a phone so uh, thanks yeah, for that, mixing things yeah. up I, I, I was almost gonna go with that but uh but i'm just trying thinking like what is more important than that and and and, and getting some physical exercise on a daily basis is is very important so that i can show up as the best husband father you know, and, you know, um, business professional. I'd like you to pretend or imagine that it's the year 2030 and you're looking back on the last decades, the last nine or 10 years, you can Mm -hmm. answer this personally or professionally, but what would you like to be looking back on? I mean, we have some pretty, um, what I like, I, I, you know, my biggest, the biggest thing I would say that I would like to look back and, and feel like I did a good job is just, you know, raising good human beings with my kids, you know, teaching them good emotional intelligence, teaching them, you know, to want to be hungry and successful and, and, and grid and, and, and be willing to fail and make mistakes and learn and things like that. Those are things that are really important to me and uh, are always a work in progress. 
Colin, I've really enjoyed chatting to you for the last 30 minutes. I'll leave links to your website, your podcast, your LinkedIn below. Uh, and I wish you all the best from here on forward. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me on. Really appreciate it.